It's Brainwash with Dr. Tom and Drum Rolls with Scotty Irvin. Motorhead, Iron Fist. Exactly. Somewhere around the time Ozzy Osbourne's uh, I Don't Know was uh, penetrating my mind, as well as some other bands that I was listening to at that point, I became aware of more, if you will, heavy metal-oriented bands. Mm -hmm. Um, I became aware of uh, Ozzy's previous band, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, a then-newer band called Iron Maiden, um, different people like that, and... Radio was actually playing some of these people at that point, so it's kind of funny, but a lot of what I learned did, in fact, come from a device that nowadays seems to be something you would seek only if you were trying to avoid new music. Mm -hmm. you know. But then again, maybe that was just the mindset I was in at that time. Motorhead, incidentally, was not one of those bands I heard on the radio. Musically speaking, if there were no ACDC, there would be no Scotty Irving. Mm -hmm. Motorhead has come very close on a couple of occasions as far as eclipsing ACDC is my favorite band. I can also say that Motorhead is uh, in that same line of thinking when I say if they didn't exist, Scotty Irving would not exist in terms of a musical sense here. Mm -hmm. I'm talking strictly you know, that from that point of view. Right. My beliefs, uh, uh, Christian beliefs, or even my musical uh, beliefs don't necessarily come into play here, but how I play music was somehow influenced by what they do, enough that I still say that. Mm -hmm. Motorhead was, uh, it's kind of like hearing ACDC the first time because I had heard about them, mm -hmm. but didn't know anything as, I had no concept of what people were talking about when they said that they were really fast or they were really heavy, et cetera, et cetera. I had an idea of what heavy and fast were. and Well, Motorhead pretty much stomped that into the ground. <laughs> um, this was the early 80s, by the way. There were no Metallicas and Exciters and Slayers and bands like that, but that would come later, and I enjoyed that movement. But this was before that movement started, mm -hmm. and it's kind of funny because, like I said, the first time I heard them, not unlike what happened with me the first time I heard ACDC. First off, I thought I had it on the wrong speed. <laughs> I thought the guitar sounded, you know, very raw, and the bass was very distorted, which that's just a, that's a standard Motorhead thing. Mm -hmm. And Lemmy sounds, well, Lemmy's best uh, description for his own voice is the voice of broken glass. <laughs> you folks will hear what I'm talking about, those of you that don't know who they are and have never heard them before. Um, Lemmy's voice is very, very, very scratchy. Um, at times, he kind of resembles, people are going to think I'm nuts for saying this, the movie A Star is Born, the remake with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. There's a song called Hellacious Acres where Chris Christopherson is wearing a mask and is singing through the mask. That kind of reminds me of the voice that Lemmy has. <laughs> If you see that movie sometime, the first verse before he goes into the chorus, he's wearing the mask. It's got Lemmyisms. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Lemmyisms. Lemmyisms. We have a new word here, one that should probably be you know taken out as soon as possible. I should also mention during this time that um, I had the drum set, and I was starting to win awards in school, believe it or not. Cool. Um, I won... Four awards while I was in seventh and eighth grade, and I won one while I was uh, won one. I won one. <laughs> I won another while I was in the ninth grade, and mm -hmm. um, it was weird to me because suddenly here was something that I was at least somewhat good at, apparently, judging by the awards. Mm -hmm. And it was so weird to me because it was something that I got into for the most part by accident. Mm -hmm. So accidents can happen, and sometimes it's a good thing. So anyway, but Motorhead ripped my head off. It was beautiful, you know. <laughs> like I said, yeah, I, I had no, I, I had seen reviews. One review on the album Overkill, I thought was hilarious. Mm -hmm. This guy went so far as to say that there was no other heavy metal album he would bother listening to that month. And later on, I understood why. But I think the one review that really got my attention, I was a Ted Nugent fan, and one review said makes Ted Nugent sound like a, a prepubescent choir boy. <laughs> That really burned me up, and I'm like, what? you talking about the mighty Ted? And then I heard them, and I'm like, holy smokes. Now I know why they were saying that. Wow. It's Brainwash with Dr. Tom and Drum Rolls with Scotty Irvin. We have discussed ten of his influence songs. We have the final ten to go, beginning with Akira Ifukubi. Sounds good to me. I usually say Ifukubi, <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Godzilla.
Okay. I should point out uh, that uh, the Godzilla themes um, somehow got into my uh, influences well, once again, a long, long time before I actually started playing drums. Mm-hmm. During the time I was playing drums, the Godzilla series was started again in Japan in 1984. And at first, they didn't really get Akira Fukubi to do some of the old themes again. They were getting some different composers. Mm-hmm. And people complained, and he came back at the end of the uh, late 90s. But they were um, incorporating a lot of his themes from previous movies into the newer ones mm-hmm. without him playing them, which you know still brought some of those same influences, but... Um, his stuff was very dramatic, very orchestrated, and he's also responsible not only for the music on those earlier ones. Um, he created the roar that Godzilla is, uh, you know, normally associated with. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and he, he, apparently, what he used was a glove, a resin-covered glove, and ran ran the uh, fingers of the glove across a uh, the strings of a, a bass fiddle or a contrabass, whatever oh, you cool. prefer. And um, as far as the footsteps or whatever that were uh, used, that's actually a, a knotted piece of rope uh, being smacked against a timpani drum. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, different things like that. So that, that influenced me to a certain extent, too, later on in some of my more experimental uh, type work. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, well, you can make sounds with instruments. You don't necessarily have to make songs with instruments. <laughs> um, I should point out, we were talking about Motorhead earlier. Mm-hmm. Um We'll talk about some other bands that are somewhat in that same league a bit later on. Mm -hmm. But uh, around the time I first started getting into music and playing a bit more seriously, a word that people were using a lot that I thought was kind of peculiar at the time, it was usually described as a negative thing. Um, they were referring to it as noise. Mm-hmm. They didn't think what I was playing was up to you know par or whatever. The funny thing is, the word noise for me means something altogether different now than it did then. Uh-huh. Um, I'll explain that a bit later on with some of the more obvious okay. pieces that, that will accompany it. But okay. like I said, the, the word noise is being used a lot. And I, I later came to realize that it was one of those situations where it's personal opinion mm-hmm. more so than anything else. One man's noise is another man's symphony, I suppose. Mm-hmm. In my case, I found the two somewhat inseparable, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later, too. It's Brainwash with Dr. Tom and Drum Rolls with Scotty Irvin, Godflesh, Spite. Godflesh features Justin Broderick, a former member of uh, Napalm Death, and yet another example of a, a band member leaving a band and bringing a slight influence from the previous band into his uh, current work. I say current, uh, Godflesh is no longer a band, but uh, Justin Broderick's uh, Godflesh vision was very, very much like Na- Napalm Death in one way mm-hmm. and totally dissimilar in other ways. Drum-wise, they were using a drum machine. I would still cite that drum machine as a very big influence on me. I wasn't even aware at the time that there was any real difference in um, what they were doing in terms of uh, drumming and with what a normal drum machine would be. I'd heard drum machines up until that point that sounded like drum machines. Mm -hmm. Theirs, I could tell it was a machine, but it sounded more human. In other words, it sounded more, shall we say... More ominous, I think, is a good way to put it. And, I mean, I've tried to duplicate some of the drum beats uh, that they played on the kit just for the heck of it, mm-hmm. and it sounds wrong. Mm-hmm. It sounds very wrong because it, you can get the syncopation, but you can't get the same feel. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess it's kind of like driving a Rolls Royce or driving a Pinto, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, you have the idea here. Um, prop, since Justin Broderick was a former drummer, I forgot to point out by Napalm Death, I suppose it's also inevitable that I was kind of gravitating toward Godflesh. He was the guitar player and singer in Godflesh, mm-hmm. but he programmed a lot of what went on the drum machine, and I think that's where a lot of this comes into play for me. Those rhythms definitely influenced me. It also made me appreciate more what a drum machine could actually do mm-hmm. in the context of a band as opposed to replacing a drummer in a band, like mm-hmm. so many people probably were looking at it at that time and maybe still do. Mm-hmm. 